This episode of CPP Cast is sponsored by Backtrace, the turnkey debugging platform that helps you spend less time debugging and more time building. Get to the root cause quickly with detailed information at your fingertips. Start your free trial at backtrace.io slash cppcast. CppCast is also sponsored by CppCon, the annual week-long face-to-face gathering for the entire C++ community. Get your ticket today. Episode 111 of CppCast with guest Patrice Roy, recorded July 26, 2017. This episode, we talk about new VS features and changes to Boost. Then we talk to Patrice Roy, teacher and member of the C++ Standards Committee. Patrice shares his thoughts with us about the recent Toronto C++ Standards meeting. Welcome to episode 111 of CPP Cast, the only podcast for C++ developers by C++ developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co-host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? Doing good, Rob. How are you doing? I'm okay. Uh, I'm back on my old laptop, which is a little aggravating. I got a new one four months ago, yeah. and all of a sudden, like all but the top inch and a half of pixels died on me. So I just All to but L. the top? I could see That's the top exciting. inch and a half. Yeah, I've seen I've seen halvesies a couple of times, but I've never seen across the top like that. Yeah, that's all I could see. The rest was just black. It's pretty pretty annoying. I would like to say, just on a side note, it is kind of exciting that this is our 11 first episode. Too. <laughs> I didn't even think and about for people, that. People who weren't paying attention, I believe we had 11 one slides in our uh, context for all the things talk that Ben and I did. Was that done intentionally? Well, no, but there are several subtle references to Lord of the Rings in there. And yes. I told Ben, we just have to leave it at 11D1 since that's where it is now. Anyhow. Awesome. I don't think we'll end up keeping that for CPP Congo. <laughs> yeah, you got to have a longer talk, right? Shorter. Oh, shorter. Okay. Well, at the top of every episode, yeah. the top of every episode I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, this week, we, we got a couple tweets about last week's episode. Uh, this one was from TJ Chip, and he asked, Is it true that C++ futures have no future and coroutines are the way forward as stated on the recent CPP cast? And, yeah, I we, I feel like we need to witness a debate on this. Um, Gore put in his opinion, kind of reiterating the, the points he went over in the episode. I'd love to hear someone like Felix's thoughts on that, uh, since we recently did that talk on uh, his future proposal a couple episodes yes. back. So. I can tell you that it's a very heated discussion point at the committee, and it takes up a tremendous proportion of the SG-1 time. You know, I was going to say, I bet our guest today would have a, a comment on that, so maybe we can dig into that more in a few minutes. Yeah, if sounds good. If you want good. to. <laughs> okay, and we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show as well. Uh, you can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cbbcast.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes. Joining us again today is Patrice Roy. Patrice has been playing with C++ either professionally for pleasure or both for over 20 years. And after a few years doing R&D and working on military flight simulators, he moved on to academics and has been teaching computer science since 1998. Since 2005, he's been involved more specifically in helping graduate students and professionals from the fields of real-time systems and game programming, developing the skills they need to face today's challenges. The rapid evolution of C++ in recent years has made his job even more enjoyable. He's been a participating member of the ISO C++ Standards Committee since late 2014 and has been involved with the ISO Programming Language Vulnerabilities since late 2015. He has five kids and his wife ensures their house is home to a continually changing number of cats, dogs, and other animals. Patrice, welcome to the show. Hello there. All right, Patrice, now that we've introduced you, <laughs> what? Let's, go, let's dig in for a minute about this coroutines versus futures and how much time it takes in the committee. 
in the committee as, as a whole, not that much because okay. it's pretty much tied to the workings of SG1. It's a heated topic because you've got some big names that have written uh, position papers on that one in recent months. Uh, Sean Parra has written something. Uh, you know Gore's position. Gore's work is tremendous. Uh, Can you remind us what's the purpose of the SG1 group? It's the concurrency and parallel okay. programming group. So they sit down and talk about this executors, memory model stuff, uh, atomic slashes barriers. And I think there's been more than a day. I wasn't there, but more than a day on futures only at the last meeting. Wow. Yeah, because there's many competing proposals and points of view over that. We know that the ones we have are suboptimal for a number of reasons, but they, they are there and they work. They, I, I use them for some stuff, but I, I agree that we can do a better job. So maybe at the risk of um, uh, asking you to, I don't know, burn some professional bridges or something, do you have an opinion? <laughs> I, 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 I wouldn't throw futures in the garbage for a moment. The, the, at least as a teaching tool, they are useful. They can do cute stuff. They might be underspecified. In, yeah, you, you can do cute stuff with that. They, they are underspecified a bit. I mean, I, I'm sure that some people would use them if they knew for a fact that it uses a thread pool. Right. But but they won't because it's not specified as such, and we don't have thread pools because we don't have executors, and executors are the way we where we want to go for that, but they're not ready yet. So for a number of reasons, it's not exactly what we want, but it still works, and we have something to teach and something to use. The coroutines are going to be awesome. I don't know if they will replace futures completely. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to coroutines, but we have futures. We can use them, so that's already something. So do you agree that coroutines can do everything that a future could do? <laughs> you, you, you had words from a much better, much uh, greater expert on the topic last week than I am. Yeah, but okay. At, at the same time, he, he, he has an understandable bias. So, so, But he's he's a great guy, and I'm sure that he's, he, his opinion is worth more than mine on this topic. I, I would hold both for the moment, but I'm sure that futures will change and evolve because there's so much work in that area right now. Well, I can. I mean, from a personal perspective, I've never used a coroutine, but I have used futures, and I do find them handy when that's the kind of thing that I need. Yeah. The, the, mm. the thing with coroutines is they're very light, so you can run a huge amount of them. It doesn't really show up on your CPU and memory usage. So the, the lightness of it is very cool, whereas with futures right now, I might be corrected by SG1 people, but I think they end up mapping to a single thread, and they are stackful, so they, they consume more resources. So if you want to compete with Go and the Go routines, you're probably better with the Go routines that Gore has put up than with other mechanisms. That being said, there's two kinds of Go routines. There's Gore's Go routines, and there are library level ones that are different a bit. So it's it's not a clear cut topic. You know, there's at least two competing approaches there. There's a, a boost implementation of a library level one. Is that correct? Yeah, and I think that what's being proposed for the standard is based on that. But again, I'm not the expert for that one. <clears throat> oh, so there are currently competing standard proposals even. Yeah, I, I, I get the feeling that the language level one will win, but that does not necessarily exclude the other one and there's valid points that one can be, can make to keep the library level one too, maybe under a different name, I don't know. Okay. Interesting. There's okay. a lot of work in SG1. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well we got a couple of news articles to discuss and then we're going to talk more about, more about the Toronto trip report, okay? Patrice? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so this first one is updates coming in uh, Visual Studio 2017 15.3 uh, update. And this is a bunch of diagnostic improvements, uh, which I'm sure are going to be quite handy. Um, changes with bring compiled headers, um, empty declarations, which I thought was interesting. Uh, they could be used in template metaprogramming, and people are running into problems with that. Is there anything uh, you guys wanted to call out in this one? Well, I tried it. I installed it, tried it. I ran it on my PHD code, which is a big chunk. It's actually quite cool. There's, there's one thing that annoys me there, and annoys me with Clang too, is the warnings for moments where you are initializing your member variables in a different order than the order in which you have declared them. Because I don't really care. I don't make them interdependent. But I understand why the warning's there. It's an okay warning. It's just bugging me because I wouldn't care that much in my code, to be honest. One thing I noticed with this is that this compiler update shipped with STD byte. 
And Spring mm. SD Byte means that if you compile your own code and you included a platform header of some kind and you had a using namespace SD in your code, you end up with a sh- a lot, <laughs> a, a lot of errors that that are easy to remove. You just remove the using the using space directive because otherwise you you end up with a fight with SD byte and the byte of your platform, whatever it is. So interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and I find it fascinating that the one that you called out is the uh, warning that I'm the most excited about. Because that makes, uh, having worked on cross-platform teams, um, and GCC and Clang are so willing to warn on you initializing members out of order. And then if you, but if, if part of your team is only working on Visual C++, then you end up with like hundreds of warnings when you go to compile and you're like reordering everyone's initializers. I'm just I'm happy that it it warns because sometimes there is reason to make them interdependent on each other. I'm okay with this. Yeah, it's it's it, it's slightly annoying, but I understand it's a, it's a worthwhile thing. It's just ah, I, 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 as you did, I, I standardized my ordering on all the compilers to just make it go away. So that's okay. I'm also fascinated by the second warning that they mention here, that it will suggest to you to use if const expr, if it's something that is a constant expression, constant conditional. I didn't even know the Visual Studio supported if const expr yet. Yeah, yeah, it, it has for a little while, but it, it's an awesome warning. That one is really, really cool. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a great one. I don't even know if any of the other compilers, I don't think they do, are, are, supporting, are doing a similar warning yet. That's, I like that. I give them a few weeks and they will all do this. If one of them does it, they're all they're all going to do it. Right. That's true. Okay, uh next one. Big change looks like it'll be coming to boost. They're going to move from their uh proprietary build system to using uh CMake, which sounds pretty exciting. It does. Yeah. It sounds uh, exciting to me. I'm I'm such a a a, a child when it comes to CMake, I've barely touched it. I, I'm an old schooler. I used Make and, and very old tools. So I, I, everyone talks about it. I know so little about that. One thing I know is that I, I tried to compile and install Boost a few years ago. It was painful. It was getting nicer. And I'm sure this is a good move, but I'm sure that all of you have better opinions than I do on this one. <laughs> well, they, you know, CMake is the tool that everyone loves to hate. And that's fine. But it's also having the tool to, everyone uses. It's the tool everyone uses, and having to throw Boost Jam into the mix when you're building a large project and you want to be able to build everything from scratch, you know, it, it's, it just adds to the complexity of your build system. Yeah. Which is already a big beast in itself. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then this last article is a trip report from uh, Guy Davidson, who we've talked to before. And this was a, an incredibly detailed trip report. I definitely would encourage all listeners to, to read this if you're interested in how the, uh, the ISO meetings go. He, instead of focusing on the results of the meeting, which most trip reports seem to do, he really did a breakdown day by day on what the process is like, which I found to be pretty interesting as someone who's never attended an ISO meeting. Uh, yeah, guy's an awesome guy. Let's start with that. It was his first meeting. I went for a beer with him the day, the day before because I was glad to see him. Uh, knowing that he could actually vote and participate, he was ecstatic. <laughs> he's been going all over the place. He's been participating in everything. He's very enthusiastic all the time. Really, it's a cool report for from a very, very cool person. Uh, the uh, we're, we're all better for him participating in this. I hope he'll be able to go to the next ones too. Uh, the, the, there's two quotes that I really liked uh, from his core work because he came for a morning with us uh, at core, which is a very different experience because we're not screaming at each other or throwing tomatoes or anything. <laughs> right. So th- there's a thing where he says, after the discussion in the other groups, the silence was deafening broken only by the thrum of the air conditioning actually whispered to someone this 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 is lovely effectively if you go from evolution which there's a big room where people cut each other sometimes because they're all very intense and you go to that very cerebral place it's uh, for some scary for others a very different thing and the other one i i I liked was uh where he said i made my first direct contribution to the standard because i corrected the use of an indefinite article from an n to an a my delight was observed by the project editor for which he offered a fist bump. It was a glorious moment. (laughs) (laughs) But what he said after that is true. There's no pedantry in core. It's all important. We work on clarity and we reduce ambiguity, which is exactly what we do. So it's not for everyone, but I'm glad he he didn't stay. (laughs) But I'm glad he liked the little time he spent with us. 
Well, I mean, it sounded like he was trying to spend some time in every working group, which would have been quite the task, it seems like. No, no, it's the thing to do. If it's the first time you go somewhere like that, you should try to sit for at least a half a day in each of the places that you can go to. Maybe not all the study groups, there's too many. But it's a very different experience from place to place. It gives you a better idea of what the committee is. Even if you don't contribute much, even if you just listen, uh, make some small comments, but the fact that you're there and get a feeling for it is cool. There was another guy whose name escapes me, a professor from New Toronto, who came in with us and just worked and took notes and discussed and that's what we suggested we told them like go around talk to people and sit in different rooms get a feeling for the thing so it's better than sitting in the same place for how for the whole week at least for the first time sometimes you are surprised by the places where you feel more comfortable and more useful so try it so it looks like uh albuquerque is the next one which i really wish i could go to because that's a pretty easy drive for me but well i guess i'll be in berlin instead so yeah. i'll take that sacrifice <laughs> Uh, but it looks like they've announced where the, the next upcoming ones are for people who are interested, which I, I did not see these posted previously. Uh, so, very recent stuff. We yeah, have Florida in February, March. Florida yeah. in March, I think. We go to Rappersville next summer. Yeah, Switzerland. Uh, yeah, Switzerland. That, that, one, that one is a bit costly. We have to put money away. Um, there's, there, there's a few. There's talk of having maybe two. We tend to have two in the U.S. every year, continental U.S., and one somewhere else. This year it was Toronto, which is somewhere else in the U.S., even though it's very, very close to the frontier um, and, and to the border. And and there might be two in Europe in 2019 or 18, something. Uh, there was talk of one in Northern Ireland. There was talk about one in Bulgaria, maybe, and maybe one in Frankfurt or somewhere in Germany. Oh, wow. Like, uh, Cologne, hmm. maybe. So, uh, but but th there's no, nothing official because for some U.S. residents, it's difficult to go outside sometimes. So we'll see. Well, it's not necessarily getting any easier for our foreign friends to visit the United States no, either. That's true. Uh, being one of the foreign friends, I can I can attest to that. <laughs> but Toronto is extremely convenient for you, right? Uh, I, I went there by train. It was a nice ride. Uh, it okay. took me five hours. I could work. I had Wi-Fi. The, the only problem was that the train was trembling a lot because the tracks between Toronto and Montreal are shaky a bit, so red wine was spilling all over the place. And it was complicated. <laughs> oh, that sounds terrible. <laughs> well, you, you get out of the train, you're a bit dirty. And th the nice thing about Toronto is you can walk everywhere. It's very, it's very easy to walk from the hotel to the university. It's about a 15-hour walk. It was warm a bit, maybe, but it was a nice week. So, yeah, pretty convenient. I've heard that parts of the Canadian Railway, anyhow, can be uh, very beautiful. I haven't done any of that myself. Uh, it's it's hard to tell. I've been working all all the all the way in and all the way out, and I've been working all week. I didn't look at much stuff apart from buildings. All <laughs> you know, okay. A meeting you work from seven in the morning to like twelve in the in the evening. So so it's you don't see much. You just work all the time. Wow. Crazy. Okay, so um, speaking more about Toronto and, and the actual work of the ISO meeting, um, so most of the work from what we can see was related to C++20. Um, is there anything left to do on C++17? We cannot add anything. Uh, the, the ballot is ongoing right now. My understanding, you have to understand that it's my first uh, ever standards participation in this case. Uh, my understanding is that if there's no national body that complains, it will be a standard before Albuquerque. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, my uh, the, the, now take this with a grain of salt. It's my understanding. I might be making mistakes, but that's pretty much it. Uh, if there's at least one national body that has a, a singular problem with it, uh, I think we have to rebalance things afterwards, and then it's not a unanimous vote. It's a vote that has less than so many complaints that we need to have. That, that bears a different name. We don't expect that to happen. We expect defect reports to come in, things to fix but we don't expect people to reject the standard in its current form. So it, it might happen, but I would be surprised. So barring nothing coming up, you expect it in the next two months or something like that? Yeah, well, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's an administrative process. So it's the ISO rules that are being applied right now, and right. it's between Switzerland and the rest of the countries. It's going to come back at some point. We're going to get an okay. Everyone is reading it, voting for it, so it's out of our hands right now. Okay. Okay. 
So uh, last week, one of the things we talked about a little bit was uh, that the verbose syntax for concepts was accepted into the C++ 20 draft. Um, what are your thoughts on whether the other syntaxes are, are going to be accepted as well before C++ 20 is done? It's funny, you know, in Toronto, it was a thing we talked about a lot, too, for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> concepts took a lot of time. It took uh, it took uh, more than of maybe not half of course time, but almost. It took an, in, an entire day and an entire evening session for current evolution together. There was a lot of work for that. Um, I'm I, I, I'll first tell you that I'm very glad that we now have concepts in the proposed standard for Super Plus Twenty. <clears throat> so this is I, I think everyone voted for that. We were glad to have that at least, even if it's not the complete thing. Um, there, there's more than two syntaxes. Uh, there's two terse ones that didn't go in right away, and there's a few more verbose ones. But the, the, there's more. one with yeah. Well, the, <laughs> the, 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 there, there's layers to the degree of detail you can put in there, and the the, the the two more succinct ones didn't pass, but the others did. So it's not one over two. It's more complex. Maybe like three over five that passed in. Um, th there's one that I have a bit of trouble with myself, with braces that I find difficult to read. Uh, mm. People are complaining that it's hard to grep for also, so it's hard to find what you wrote. Mm. Um, grep I could live with, but I, I find it difficult to, to... For such an abstract concept, just a few symbols and a pair of braces, sometimes it's not easy to read. So this, this one is not in yet. <laughs> Uh, and the one that I personally like that stirs too is one where you can use um, concept names instead of types. Like you can have f that takes a number and a number and returns a number or something. Uh, th that one didn't pass because of a few issues for it. Uh, with it, I, I expect it to come back at Albuquerque and other meetings. But there's a number of open issues. Like if you have f of auto and auto. You can pass two different types, but if you have f of integral and integral right now, you cannot have an int and a long as far as I know. You, can, you must have the same type for both. So there's a few things like that that in the current specs are hard to justify maybe, make sense to some, annoy others. So that, that's, why, that's why there's no consensus over the feature. You have I've to understand. You have to understand that we voted for that syntax, but it was a very weak for, so there's no consensus. The majority mm -hmm. is not sufficient at the committee to make this thing pass. Uh, so I, I want to take a, a minute. So uh, you said if, if you can just use a concept name as if it were a type name, like number. So yeah, I've seen like some tweets about this, and, and since I, don't, I haven't been really been following concepts, I wasn't sure if I fully understood. So some people are saying if it's a number and a number, then they can be two different integral types or whatever that, that happen to match the concept of number. And some people are saying if it's number and number, then they must be the same type, right? Yeah, but when you have auto and auto, there's no constraint that's saying that you have to have the same type in both cases. And auto is supposed to be the most general concept. So there, there's disagreement over this kind of thing, which is... Which tells us that maybe we haven't clarified really what we intend with this. Okay. Mm. So, so there's, there's a weak four, but it's not a strong enough four to make it go forward as is. But we still have a few years before C20. If we, if we make a lot of use cases, uh, look at it in more detail and are more convinced as a group of what we expect from this kind of syntax, maybe it will pass. Uh, when I was at my first meeting, we had accepted a comment from a country that suggested that we can return a sortable, say, from, from a function, so add a concept as a return type. And uh, it had been implemented, and it worked, but um, the compiler people mostly, I think, uh, are of the opinion right now that there's too many obscure cases to, to take the position that the, th the, the feature is fully cooked. Well, we we still they're not against they want it to be better specified. That's my understanding. We currently have the precedent already with generic lambdas that you can have two different things called auto that are different things. Mm -hmm. That will so, work also with concepts. Okay, yeah, it, it does seem like you know requiring two different things called auto to be the same thing wouldn't wouldn't be consistent. But I I definitely also agree that it seems like it could be confusing if you have concept names in there that are different things ultimately. 
Yeah, as long as we don't have a clear understanding of what we want, it's yeah. difficult to make a thing go forward. But there's something with lambdas now that have been introduced by Louis Dion, which is you can have a lambda that's constrained, like lambda that takes a T and then TT instead of auto auto. So you can have generic lambdas with specified template um Templated types, so, she, right. so that you can now constrain two types. This is not very far from the concept thing. So maybe guidance from one would lead into clarifying the other. When you work with concepts, it's very abstract stuff. So uh, it's uh, it's important, I think, that we agree on what we intend and mean with that thing because it's going to be used all over the place. And concepts are a game changer. So, hmm. so Louise' uh, paper on on constrained uh, lambdas that was accepted, correct? As far as I know, we worked on it, and we proposed it, and people voted for it. Okay. Yeah. That's well, an interesting one. Yep, yep, yep. It's going to be useful, yep. What are your thoughts on some of the other uh, major TSs, like modules, uh, coroutines? We actually we talked about it a lot last week, but do you think some of those are going to get voted into the standard draft in, at Albuquerque, maybe? Uh, I, I don't know when, but I expect okay. modules to go in. Uh, there's so much work being done on modules, and... Uh, uh, in Kona, there was still a lot of obscure cases, but things have gone forward, and we were really, really close in this case. Uh, the, we spent more than a day at core again on the modules wording. We clarified a few things. Uh, it, it's really starting to make sense from everybody's perspective. Uh, there's been great work. Gabby has done great work with this, Richard, and everything. Uh, modules I, I have sincere hopes for. Coroutines, I hope, too. But modules and concepts, I'm pretty sure we have something for C++20. Big things. It would be uh, maybe one of our listeners who's interested in this kind of thing could set up a betting pool of, you know, <laughs> when we expect each thing to get voted in. And you can... <laughs> one thing you can expect is, is you can expect bigger features because we collectively agreed that we want we will spend less time on the little things and more time on the big things for this one because we really want mm. them to pass through. So expect okay. maybe less library features or something because there were a lot of them in C17, but uh, a few big things in the language that will change the way we code, which which is pretty exciting. Oh, according to Guy's trip report, it looks like a lot of effort was spent on ranges. Oh, yeah, yeah. But uh, it, it was in library evolution and library a lot. They reviewed the wording for days. Library does library does a lot of the wording in the standard. The, the upper end of the wording, the, the the high number pages are there. Score does the low number pages. And ranges were a, a big thing for them. So uh, we're, it's, it's one of those that everyone has been looking for for a long while and really wants to use. So yeah. And it's a good test bed for concepts too because they have conceptified, right. in a sense, the, the wording. So if it works there, we're hopeful we're going to be able to spread out the thing all over the place. Am I correct in my understanding that for ranges to become a TS, concepts had to come in first because it relies on concepts? It would have had to be rewritten otherwise. It would have been okay. cool with Mabel <laughs> ifs all over. And I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they will be very happy that both come in at the same time. Okay. I wanted to interrupt this discussion for just a moment to bring you a word from our sponsors. Backtrace is a debugging platform that improves software quality, reliability, and support by bringing deep introspection and automation throughout the software error lifecycle. Spend less time debugging and reduce your mean time to resolution by using the first and only platform to combine symbolic debugging, error aggregation, and state analysis. At the time of error, Backtrace jumps into action, capturing detailed dumps of application and environmental state. Backtrace then performs automated analysis on process memory and executable code to classify errors and highlight important signals such as heap corruption, malware, and much more. This data is aggregated and archived in a centralized object store, providing your team a single system to investigate errors across your environments. Join industry leaders like Fastly, Message Systems, and AppNexus that use Backtrace to modernize their debugging infrastructure. It's free to try, minutes to set up, fully featured with no commitment necessary. Check them out at backtrace.io slash cppcast. Uh, one of the things you mentioned before the interview was uh, the Programmer's Bill of Rights. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, but I can't tell you much because it doesn't gone forward much. Uh, what I can tell you is that the committee is, is looking at the way it works. It's been doing that for a little while now. And it's also looking at the way the language evolves because we're moving too fast for some and not fast enough for others. 
Um, so yes, some people are are not at C plus plus eleven yet, uh, or will stay there for a while. And some people are hoping that we go on a more than uh, faster than three year cycle, which we I don't think we will because we would never get anything done if we did that. Um, so the idea of a bill of rights and of a bill of responsibilities that they would go together in this case uh, is us telling people, here are your rights. So we're, here is what you can expect from the language. Uh, here is what we will keep stable. Here is how we will deprecate things. Uh, here is what you can count on. Um, here are the rules, really. And on the other end, the responsibilities are, uh, wh wh this is what you should do if you want to survive language changes. So when we change things, hmm. if you have respected those rules, you haven't cheated the system by adding names into a CD, for example, well, expect your code to keep on working or be manageable when we change things. Because if people want change, we have to have a life cycle management of some sorts. But it's a spec, it's not a product that we have. So this is where we're going. We want to tell people better how to write their code such that their code lasts. And... Uh, in such a way that we can evolve the language uh, and they can keep up with the pace. So do you expect uh, that for the most part, these would fall into things that uh, compiler warnings and static analyzers would already be catching? Or do you expect maybe there would be new tools to help make sure people are programming in a way that can be portable forward? You can expect both. Uh, people have even talked about standardizing some warning messages, uh, hmm. but it's, it's it's something that's floating around. There's nothing official in there. We're just talking right now. But you, we want programmers to, when you see that warning, well, you know you've made a blunder or something, but you know what it means. You know, it's almost codified in the standard, and you can actually make your code uh, work for all compilers if you respect the rules properly. We want to make it clearer for people. There's so many people who have beliefs about volatile and, and STD uh, that, that are completely wrong, but they're using proprietary extensions or what have you, what have you. So yeah, we want people to write code that lasts and we want the language to evolve faster. And that's the way we, I think we're going to go. We're going to tell you what to do and what you can count on. And we hope that we'll do this right. There's a group that's working on that right now, but it's all, uh, it's it's evolving, it's all new, it's all fresh. There's nothing official right now. So what we're talking doing that right now, we're, we're talking about things that are in the air, not things that are written. Interesting. Yeah, I only yeah. just this week saw a place where I, I personally thought a standardized compiler warning would be awfully handy. And that's using standard move on a const value, which is almost 99% of the case, not what you meant to do. Yeah. But what, what, what would be the use in this case of a standard message instead of a custom one? Well, uh, just, well, Okay, that's a good question. I don't know. I hadn't really thought about that, but it seemed like something that all tools could be uh, could usefully warn on. Yeah, I, I understand that. Well, this is, I, I think it's exciting news uh, that that we are looking at ways to take the evolution of the language uh, in our hands as a process and get people better through that, so that their code evolves better. I, I think it will help uh, both those who think. This is moving too fast and it's crazy uh, and are a bit scared of what's going on. So they're sticking with old compilers and old tools and old ways of doing things where, whereas they could really do better today with what we have. And, and it will give confidence to people who want to go forward. So I think it's exciting. It's, it's process work, but it's exciting news. Mm. Okay. Um, you also uh, mentioned some work you're doing with SG12 and, and the undefined behavior study group. Do you want to tell us about that? <laughs> Uh, th th that was one of those I was I was looking forward to when I went to Toronto. Um, WG23, which I think we've talked about before, is a, a a much smaller group than WG21, which is the ISO C++ uh, committee. Uh, WG23 works on language programming vulnerab vulnerabilities. They're publishing a big document that tries to do cross-language explanations of things you should not do. Uh, it's been perceived that as, as something attacking C in some circles because there's hmm. so many ways you can put yourself in trouble when you're doing C code. <laughs> And C++ was seen in such a light, under such a light also, because it's seen as some kind of C with other features by some who don't program in C++ very often, to be honest, because there are two very different languages today. Um, we, being in Toronto, 
uh, and the convener of WG23 being uh, from Ontario also, also the same province, we had the chance to actually meet with him in person in this case. So he went to, he went with us to the CN Tower because we had a reception there on Wednesday night. And he went working with us on Thursday afternoon. It was a relatively small group, maybe 15 people or so. Bjarne was there among others. I was there. Um, where uh, he, uh, the, uh, Stephen Michel, the convener of WG23, explained what this group does. Uh, Gabi Dostreis, the um, chair of SG12, explained what uh, SG12 does, their perspective. Bjarne talked about security, vulnerability, and good practice from the perspective of the language of C++, what we're trying to do. So now the thing is, instead of going to don't do this, it's bad, we're trying in C++ to tell people, even though you could do this, do this instead, it's better. <laughs> Mm -hmm. We're trying to show good practice more than bad practice. We're trying to, we know that people can go um, around the good practices and do dirty stuff if they want to. We are, we are not going to remove that from them because sometimes you have to do what you have to do. It's a systems programming language. But we, we are trying to get people to doing better code. We have the GSL, the, the guideline the library that is, uh, working well with static analysis tools to refactor things for people. We have the Clang utilities. Uh, we have a number of books that try to tell people you should code like this instead of like this. Not only is it shorter, but it's faster. It's, it's generates better code. It's safer for you. So if you really want to put yourself into a bold, you can do it, but you can do better now. So we, we're trying to put together a joint venture with WG23 and SG12, where instead of writing an annex to the WG23 document that says, this is bad stuff, we're going to promote proper ways of doing things in C++. To make things easier, we're also trying to co-locate with them. So we expect, as far as I'm concerned, it's going to work. We expect WG23 to meet in Albuquerque at the same time we do in November, so that we can spend a day or half a day with them together to get a better grasp of what each group does and make things go forward together. Mm. It's pretty exciting news, to be honest, because the two groups haven't spoken much with one another for a long while. The I, There's a few C++ people around the WG23, but we're not numerous. It's more, mostly ADA. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, I think uh, it's good for them because we're, we're a very big group and we can we have more resources. And it's good for us because uh, it will give us an avenue to tell people how to write better C++ code. I just want to understand this WG23 group a little bit better. It's a group of programmers of different languages that put out just general recommendations in the form of some paper at the end of their process. I mean, they're, they're not making specific suggestions to a, a language governing body. You know, you shouldn't do this. It's just general recommendations. Uh, it's more tricky than that. Okay. When, you have, when there's a standard that's published by ISO and you're using a language that uh, relies on that standard... Uh, you, you are, you are committing yourself to respecting the rules. So you could be sued if you're doing your job. <laughs> yeah. Wow. The, you, hmm. you are committing yourself. So, so, so these guidelines are actually useful for, for those who are paying you to do the job because they know what they can expect. And they're, they're useful for you in order to do your job properly and, and avoid all the legal assholes you could get if you're doing a messy job. Uh, so WG23 is doing useful work. Uh, they're, they're much smaller than we are, as I said, so they, they, they cannot go forward as fast. Uh, and they're trying to have a Perl language annex. And there's a few already existing, but there's no C++ annex. It would be big. It's a very big language. Uh, most of their annexes are, as I was saying, don't do this. And we're trying with C++ to go another way. This is a work in progress, of course, but it would be a different than next a bit, and it would promote good working practices. Okay. That's interesting. It looks like they have a lot of documents they've published that one might be uh, find interesting to browse through. Yeah, well, it's public stuff. You can go on their 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 website, WG23, and you'll see a number of things. Uh, they, they, they we're about 130 people at the C++ meetings. At the WG23 meeting, there's less than 20 people. It's it's not the same scale at all. But co-locating is interesting. Uh, they will be able to do their own thing. We'll be able to do our own things. 
and, and getting together for some time, I, I'm sure we'll make a lot of progress together. Uh, and, and yeah, it will make the language shine a bit. There's uh, one here that I think our listeners might be interested in because, you know, everyone likes making their own language. There's the overarching language designer advice document. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't read it, so I'll believe you. <laughs> the, the, every, every time I've spoken with them, I've been uh, by uh, remotely to a few meetings. Uh, they're trying to make the uh, big document with the vulnerabilities uh, public and up to date. Uh, they're working on things such as uh, you have enums, uh, you don't want to use values that are not in there, what do you have to be careful with? What are the pitfalls? Uh, you're using objects, so use after free, use after delete are bad. Uh, calling a function on a null pointer is bad, or what have you. Some of them are very easy. Some of them are, are interesting. Sometimes they have trickier things that they warn you about. I doubt anyone would read the paper from beginning to end. It would be depressive, uh, depressing because it's only bad stuff. But uh, if you, there's a feature that you think you don't understand well enough, or you have worries about, it might be interesting to read the sections on it uh, to avoid getting into trouble in general. Yeah. Cool. Sounds exciting. Yeah. Well, well it, it's, 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 SG12 is a small group also, and defined behavior is not for everyone. <laughs> it's not something that excites everyone. We, we did have a very good afternoon with SG12, because apart from that, we had a great presentation by Lisa Lipincott, which is always awesome. It's always th thought provoking. So a reflection on assert and the meaning of assert in programs and the way she, she, she sees that uh, relies on treating the abstract C++ machine as an actual machine with parameters. It, she, she really has an interesting way of seeing things. So if you want a thought provoking app paper, Lisa Lepincuts is a very good one. And we also processed a very small one, but that should seem evident to everyone, but doesn't work right now. The fact that you can man copy into an object and that would begin the object's lifetime. So you have an uninitialized object, you mem copy the bits into it, and you don't have to do new. The object is presumed to exist after that because mem copy is special. Hmm. It's something that lots of people do, but that's not legal. <laughs> <laughs> right. It just works by accident, but it would be nice that it works because it's mandated to work. <laughs> Yeah. I have uh, mixed feelings about f certain functions that are considered to be special and come into play when we're talking about alias rules and uh, object lifetime and that kind of thing. Mem Memcopy is a special beast. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, SG oh, go ahead. J j j j just to finish the thing, SG12 is a group that tries to remove undefined behavior cases where they should not exists. So it's exploring things that are undefined behavior and it's trying to reduce the set. It will never be a, an empty set. But every time there's something like this that everyone does, kind of makes sense. And you're wondering, why doesn't it work? Well, if you can make it work, you know, why not make everyone's code work properly? Okay. So uh, what haven't we talked about yet? What do you think uh, has been kind of overlooked from the Toronto meeting that you haven't seen discussed much? The, 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 the thing that I found... The most interesting in my week, it's a, it's a feature that looks small, but when you think about it, it's very tricky to grasp, is the SIMD operations. So Pablo Alpern came to core with a wording for um, what he called wavefront policies, if I remember properly. So the, the, the thing is, uh, if you look at the way the machine works right now, the abstract machine, there are things such as sequence before that says if A is sequenced before B, well, A occurs before B. You know? So it, it gives you an idea of how your program should be ordered and what the reordering rules are when you have threads and everything. When you enter the vector operations that do many things in a single thread, time gets screwed up because there's more than one operation occurring at the same time in a given thread. So the rules are completely different. And the way the compiler can optimize your code is very different too. So Pablo was trying to express the, 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 the idea that you're, when you have a loop that's being vectorized, you can give some leeway to the compiler in order to reorder things to make them faster, but you cannot do everything. So it's kind of like taking the time that's 1D and making it into a 2D kind of time and having a staircase in there that gives you the range of places where you can play around. 
it's very thought provoking i think uh, I, when you're playing with the concept of time in the actual language uh, you have to take a step back and say oh this is deep stuff so we're going to have lots of very interesting optimizations but wording that it's it's very tricky the sequence before makes no sense with that because you have to rewrite it uh, to say something like not a occurs before b but the end of a occurs before the beginning of b mm. because they could overlap you know mm. so yeah no, so yeah it was uh, surprising i didn't expect that to make my day when it happened which was very interesting <laughs> So uh, I I think uh, Guy's article also said that there's been move some some movement on contracts. Yeah, uh, I don't know where we're going with that. There's there's uh, at least two big efforts. Uh, I haven't been to the contracts meetings, so the okay. only thing I have here is, is hearsay. Um, uh, l- 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 when I was in Kona, I had a chat with a few people after the, the meeting, and they were telling me that there were still open issues as to what do you do if there's an exception raised in the contract clause. Do you terminate the program? Do you recuperate? How do you do that? You, you have those uh, attributes that are saying you expect this and you require this or whatever. I don't know what their names are. And you put code in there. So if you evaluate the code and there is an exception, what, what do you do? So maybe there's an answer to that today. I can tell you. But th- these were open issues. Mm. Uh, Lisa, Lisa's work with the assertions tied uh, that, with into that also. The, she, she, she had in her perspective the idea that if we clarified um, what assertions are, we would make better contracts. So uh, I hope to see them in C++20, but I don't know what shape they will be in. I haven't been close enough to that. The guy who works on that the most, I think, is Juan de Daniel Garcia, or Jose Daniel Gar- G. Daniel Garcia. He's a professor from a Spanish university. Uh, he does a lot of work for the committee. I don't know how public he is, but he, he, he I think, could give you more information than I do, or John Lacoste, maybe, or one of these. Okay. Okay. Um. So you're, you're going to be uh, speaking at CVPCon this year. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about your plans there? Yeah, I, I'm very lucky because a lot of, of, of tremendous speakers uh, haven't managed to get in. I've been lucky. I have two talks coming here. Um, the, there's one that I tried at the C++ users meeting in Montreal there two months ago. I, I thought people wouldn't be interested because it's a bit abstract. It wasn't the, the, the abstract machine of C++. People don't know it exists in many cases. But when you're programming, you're not programming for a PC or for a Unix machine. You're programming for some kind of abstract machine where there are rules. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the wording, the wording is a bit obtuse, but the, but it's fun when you think about it to know what the machine does, what it doesn't do, what guarantees it provides to you. Uh, so so, so I, I did a talk on that, and it was actually pretty well received. <laughs> the only thing that was strange is that when you're going to that level, you talk about atomics and you talk about memory model and everything. And when I was preparing the room and saying hi to people coming in, uh, there's a guy named Jeff Prishing that came in. And I don't know if you know this guy, but he's one of the top-notch people about, uh, about atomics in the world, you know? So, Jeff, what the hell are you doing in this room? He said, I came to learn, hey. <laughs> but he, 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 he was very nice. He's a very nice guy. He used to work with Ubisoft. He's doing something else now. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, I, I was lucky because I knew a few people in the room already because I've been teaching for a while, it seems. <clears throat> so the more it goes and the more I know the audience. But it went well. So this this one was accepted. I'm going to adjust it a bit uh, because uh, of Lisa's ideas that I found very interesting. Uh, and, and I had a follow-up kind of talk that I proposed to, which is a bit tied to the first one. Uh, and it's also tied to what I do with SG14, the low latency group. Uh, a talk about trying to get a feature in that we need and want, but just that just doesn't fit well with the language as it stands. Uh, namely, we're trying to uh, let users specify things uh, about threads when they construct the threads. They're called thread attributes right now. Uh, it's something that Vicente uh, from Nokia uh, has worked on. I have worked on it a bit al- also. If you look at the threading API that we have right now in the language, you can create the thread and then get the native handle and play with it and call operating system functions. But mm. when you create the thread, there's nothing you can do. You're, there's no option. Uh, that means that, one, if you have a problem, you get an exception. So the non-exception users will not use it. And two, if you want to specify such things as uh, a specific stack size, there's no way to do that because mm. it's too late when the thread exists. 
Hmm. But it's hard to tell about uh, the, to tell a thread about an expected stack size when there's no stack in the standard. Because if you look for the word stack in the standard, you'll see std stack, and that's about it. Hmm. Interesting. Then, there's no stack in the stack, and then that's good because because mm-hmm. Gore's work doesn't require a stack. The, your uh, guest last week. So mm-hmm. if we impose the stack, his work would not be as efficient. It's good for many things. There are machines with more than one stack per thread. Uh, as you and people have told me about that, but we we do need a way to specify this. So there's many ways to go around. There's many pitfalls. So uh, and it's something I've been working on for a few years now. It's, it's going forward. Uh, we're going to end up with something at some point. But it's an interesting process. So there's a talk that I will be giving there. That's how do you make a feature go into the language where the language is, res- is resisting and <laughs> it's not a natural fit. So I, I found the topic to be interesting should someone else have to go through that. So yeah, so these are my two talks and I give a class too on, 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 on a practical class that's going to be after the conference. I gave one before the conference last year. It was uh, well attended and I had a lot of fun with it. Um, and this year is going to be a post-conference one. I'm going to be competing with a guy named Turner who's an awesome, <laughs> awesome instructor. So it's going to be difficult. But <laughs> I, I hope people will still come and see me. Uh, and it's going to be uh, how you, how can you take existing problems that you can solve with traditional C++ code, but then there's this whole new tool set that you have with C++ 17 that's filled with cool stuff. So what can you do even better and make your life nicer, and how can you make this uh, new stuff come to light and uh, yeah, make your programming task easier and more fun? So very practical stuff. Uh, those who come in bring their laptops will do portable code, of course, because I don't know what laptops and compilers you have. And yeah, we're going to be uh, coding based on problems that we're going to try to fix with old school techniques and then see how the new stuff comes in and makes our life better. So specifically about moving stuff to C++17 okay, yeah. effectively. Yeah. Well, for so, 17 depending on people, yeah. Okay, I was going to say, you said you said that you're going to do it in a portable way, and I'm thinking, you know, the compiler compliance for C++17 is, you know, kind of like this still all over the place. <laughs> so I'm going to wait a bit before I tell people what's the lowest mark for them, because it's uh, I, I don't want to tell people, you should right now, today, choose this or this compiler. Yeah. Right. I'm going to wait until maybe a, a month or a few weeks before and tell people, well, if you want to bring GCC, try to have at least that version, otherwise you won't have as much fun with us. And if you bring Clang, try to have at least this. And you know, if you want to use VC to this, you have something else. Please make sure that there's at least these available. Right. So it's yeah. Uh, at worst, I'm going to do demos, but it's, it's much. It's more fun when people have their hands on the keyboard and there's interaction. Uh, if yeah, with any luck, looking at you know, we've got two more months effectively, and we might get one more release from the Visual Studio compiler team by then. And yeah, they're yeah. Very efficient people these days. They're, they're very productive. I appreciate what they're doing. Yeah, they're definitely, definitely moving fast. Okay. Well, your uh, your teaching uh, class sounds really interesting. So I look forward to that. <laughs> yeah. I hope people will like that. I, I had a lot of good feedback last year. I, I like teaching. It's my full. T- it's my day job, you know. So yeah. uh, I, and and the people at CBBCon are very interesting, very talented, uh, very bright. Uh, so I expect uh, two very pleasant days with them. Yeah. It sounds like it'll be fun. Yeah. Although I will miss your class. Sorry. <laughs> Well, we should, we should have a coffee or a beer at some point. It's <laughs> definitely. Well, it's been great having you on the show again today, Patrice. Well, thank you. You're very nice. It's been a great meeting last week, uh, two weeks ago, Toronto. I'm looking forward to Albuquerque. Uh, I think we have a great language coming in, and I think you can expect C++20 to be uh, awesome. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening in as we chat about C++. I'd love to hear what you think of the podcast. Please let me know if we're discussing the stuff you're interested in. Or if you have a suggestion for a topic, I'd love to hear about that too. You can email all your thoughts to feedback at cppcast.com. I'd also appreciate if you like cppcast on Facebook and follow cppcast on Twitter. You can also follow me at Rob W. Irving and Jason at LeftKiss on Twitter. And of course, you can find all that info and the show notes on the podcast website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode is provided by podcastthemes.com. Website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode is provided by podcastthemes.com.